Um, good evening. My name is Kate Donnellan, and I am the Executive Director of Destination Imagination Colorado. And I've been a team manager for kindergartners up through eighth graders, and I work with our high school team right now. Um, so I have experience working with all age levels. Um, so um, as we move forward, we're going to just talk about your questions. So what I'd like you to do is if you have a question, I'd like you to put it in the question box, in the Q&A box at the bottom. And um, we will get that question. Um, we will, I will start to answer the questions until Shanti gets here. So if you have a question, Um, just put it in the question box. You can ask anything, like any particular thing going on with your team, anything about the creative process. This is all um, just questions and answer session for team managers. So whatever question you have, give it a try. Great, we have our first question. Our question is, my team won't work together. All they want to do is their own thing and they don't talk. And this is from Denise. Um, one second, I want to try if I can figure out something. Denise. Denise, I'm allowed. Hey, Denise. Uh, Denisa, can you're allowed to talk right now? So if you unmute your button, um, so I'd like to ask you what age students you have. If you can hear me. Hey, Denise, if you need to unmute your phone or your computer and then tell me what age. Okay, so you have younger kids. So Denise has um, uh, kindergartners, first and first and second graders. Sorry, it took me a second. <laughs> oh, okay. Here, there, you good? Yeah, I should be good. Right, we're trying to get kids to bed, so. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so you have young kids. So what I would just, um, so they just, when they were working together, they just, just do their own thing. Yeah, we put together an instant challenge for them and they, each of them has their own idea of what they do and they just start doing it. They don't talk to each other, even though my second grader uh, tries to get them to work together. It, it, ju it just fails every single time. They have okay. never su successfully completed a challenge. And they're, they're I'm using the early, uh, the Rising Stars packet that we were provided for comparatively simple challenges they just each one starts to do whatever they want to do okay and they don't talk to each other okay perfect so um actually developmentally you're they're actually doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing so um our rising stars challenge our little kiddos um they are meant to sort of work in parallel as opposed to in a as a team their ego um in their development is still really close to themselves so they don't tend to see where um they don't they don't you use other things so what i would suggest is the next time you do an instant challenge and maybe try one that is um like everybody build a building and then tell a story about a town or something like that where they're in parallel um and um and then try to combine two people together to find um to co to come to common ground does that help I guess we'll find out. <laughs> okay. Um, the other thing is that, um, again, I would, I would break them into groups, small groups of two, and then have them work together as twos, and then bring two groups of twos together to work in a four. Okay. Um, it's really hard developmentally to get um, kindergartners or kindergartners especially um, into teamwork. So have them do something together. Um, like have them each draw a flower and then talk about how those flowers all are similar. Okay. So that they're sharing what they did and then find out the commonality. Okay. It's working for me now. Oh, great. Can you see and hear me? Um, yes, we totally can. 
I'm so sorry, everyone, for the technical difficulties. I don't know what was going on. I had to shut out of things and refresh, <laughs> so my apologies. Okay, um, Shanti, why don't you introduce yourself and then we'll get back to questions. Okay, um, great, hi. Thanks everyone for being here and for your patience over the last nine minutes while I tried to figure this out. Um, I am Shanti Flaherty. I am currently the president of the DI Board of Directors, but in my other life, I have been in education for, wow, like 20 years now. I uh, was a classroom teacher um, in elementary, mostly fifth grade, and I taught gifted education, K through eight. I was a district uh, coordinator in the Vale Valley for gifted ed. And then for the last eight years, I've been writing language arts curriculum um, for the state of New York and then more recently for an ed tech company called Edmento. So that is my experience. Um, I was also once a team manager when my daughter was young and in second grade. So I had those rising stars. They're a lot of fun. Um, they're just so excited to learn. So anyway, that's that's just a gist on my background. So Shanti, we had a couple questions here for you and um, one I tried to answer a little bit. So um, our first question was about working with five-year-olds um, and how they don't talk to each other, they just do their own thing and how do you get them to work as a team? And that was from Denisa. And then Lee is sort of asking this, Leah is sort of asking them the same thing. What's a good way to motivate students to work together and not as separate individuals? Um, those are really good questions. I, I'll go back to, and I, I have a few things to share with you all that Kate will, will forward, but you know, the, the key aspects I think to working with small groups is to model and practice for them. So if you want to have students, especially younger students that don't have a lot of experience with that, you might need to model what a question and answer kind of conversation looks like for them. So oftentimes with younger kiddos, I might bring one up that I felt uh, had some skills in navigating a, a short conversation. And I would model and say, I'm gonna ask a question and then I'm gonna wait for a response and then I'm gonna follow up. So just kind of establishing uh, small, simple routines for them and outlining for them how to talk to each other in pairs first, and then you can work that into the group dynamic and switch up pairs. You could even play kind of a game, you know, where it's almost like a musical chairs and they partner up and you give them an interesting question. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be DI related. It's more about the practice of having conversation and working with one another and talking and listening. Um, so that's one strategy I've used with some success. Um, Modeling is just really key and having some clear steps outlined for students so they know exactly what to do. Does that help or their follow-up on that? So Leah or Denisa, if you have follow-up, just put it in the question and answer box and we'll get, and we'll get back to those. Um, in the meantime, while we're waiting for any follow-up questions on that, Shanti, we have a question from Michael. He wants to know if you have any tools or methods to get a quiet kid to engage in a team of boisterous fourth grade boys. <laughs> um, you know, this is actually something that's in one of the handouts, but it was... I emailed all the handouts earlier today, too, so they should have them. Great, great. But one strategy for... Um, pulling those quiet kiddos out is to use something like popsicle sticks where each student's name is on the stick and you pick them at random and have uh, <clears throat> that way it allows for more voices to speak rather than it just being kind of an open group so if you pose a question as the manager and then you say okay I'm gonna pull a stick you could be a little intentional about pulling the the quieter students stick you know and then um, reinforcing that with positive, oh, I really like what you said about this. Does anybody want to follow up on what the student's name is? That can start to help draw them out because it provides an opportunity, one, for them to speak, um, and two, to gain positive reinforcement from that opportunity, which will start to open students up. I mean, it's not going to do it in one time. So if you integrate the popsicle stick, maybe posing an interesting question while kids are having their snack 
in the first five minutes or during some kind of like social time before the work begins, you might be able to start to create a dynamic where the other students are um, more purposeful about engaging with the student who's quieter. Um, the other thing that I would suggest is to alternate um, brainstorming activities for external and internal processors. So if you have a lot of boisterous kiddos, you may want to take time to do um, like ABC brainstorming where they write on a piece of paper the alphabet and if you're brainstorming characters, they'll write like A, acrobat, B, boy, C, cat, and they can all be characters, but they're taking the time to write them down. So that gives the quieter child time to also add her ideas to the, without being overwhelmed. And I would just piggyback on what Kate said. I also oftentimes offer the option to write or draw an idea um, because sometimes kids who aren't super comfortable with speaking are more comfortable communicating what they're thinking in different ways and drawing pictures and having to explain what the picture means will also start to um, create confidence in the child about speaking in front of others and being part of the group. Our next question comes from Deborah Ireland. She says, our team is having a hard time making some decisions. What are some ways to help them with this? Uh, without a lot of context, that's a, that's a tricky one. Um, I'm, so, I'm not sure what kind of decisions they're having difficulty. With. So Deborah, if you can give us a little more context on what kind of decisions, but also in your roadmap, there are a lot of decision tools. So a lot of kiddos um, only know voting and voting has some benefits. It's nice and quick and there's winners and losers. I mean, that's the bad thing is that there's winners and losers. Um, if you try to build consensus, um, that takes a longer time um, and also can be dominated by personality types. So in the roadmap, there's a lot of analytical ways um, to select criteria and rank choices based on that criteria. And um, a lot of those are in the roadmap. But if you um, give us a little bit more context, um, I'll get back to you. <laughs> or on that, you could lead them through. That makes me think what Kate said just in a, in a general sense. Write the decision up. And then you could do a plus delta, you know, kind of like, what are the good things if we decide this way? What are the bad things if we decide this way? And they could kind of go through an analysis to arrive at a decision, which is a pretty common um, thing that we do as adults, you know. So it's a good skill to learn. The other thing is to give them a deadline. You have five minutes to make this decision because we need to move on. Um, so you can also try that. Um, okay, um, we have a silent kindergarten girl. How about getting her to understand the big idea? Oh, your question just vanished. Um, get a big idea for the main challenge. So she's the one working with five kindergartners and a, and a first grader, I believe, and she wants to get them to start understanding the big idea for the main challenge. If, if with students that young, you're going to have to ask some really deliberate questions to lead them to that, essentially. They don't typically at that age have the, the processing or developmental capacity to, to really come to decisions quickly. They're in a huge exploratory stage, you know, so they're always like kind of attaching what they already know to something new. Um, so again, I would go back to kind of the, the modeling. Here's, here are the steps I use when I have to come to a decision. What's the decision we have to arrive at? Um, and we're gonna take, you know, one minute to discuss and then we're gonna come back and share ideas and then we're gonna reflect on those ideas and we're gonna narrow it down. And this is gonna be, you could set timers too that can sometimes um, help kids. As far as processing with younger kids, sometimes they have an easier time coming up with bigger ideas. I'll go back to the drawing. They see things in pictures um, mentally for the most part because language is pretty complex for them at this age. And um, so, Sometimes having them draw their ideas before they talk about them can be a bridge to helping them uh, reach a conclusion. Great answer. 
Um, Leah is asking what are some of our favorite instant challenges for seventh graders? Um, I think I'm going to give that one to Kate. <laughs> I think she's way more expert in that than I am. So the thing you want to do with your seventh graders is really work with materials and how to use them in really interesting ways. So give them a material such as a piece of paper and ask them to figure out ways um, in order to make it stand and in order to make it connect. So things that you can try are making a flange out of like a piece of paper where you make a cone out of a piece of paper and then you tear um, little feet off the bottom so you can set it down. Um, have them explore paper, have them explore how to make it taller by like rolling it in a diagonal way, um, ripping it in different ways. I would spend a lot of time learning how to fold paper and use paper. Um, also the same thing with straws. You can make tripods with straws. Um, you can connect straws into each other. Um, so play with those materials. Um, play with um, foil. Um, what makes foil sink? Um, what makes foil, um, how would you do that? Um, the other thing is try to do some transformational instant challenges such as build a tower as tall as possible and then turn it and then invert it or build a tower and then transform it into a bridge that spans the same distance as the bridge is tall. Um, also look, if you Google Destination Imagination Instant Challenges, look for two-part challenges. Um, and those, those tend to be a little bit more difficult and perfect for seventh graders. But definitely have your seventh graders play with, all, with, rubber, with rubber bands, with paper, with straws, um, and just really see how many ways that they can use them and how quick they can attach things together. I love that. And if they're just working with different materials, one thing I would just add is if you're, if you're not familiar with this technique, SCAMPER, um, it's an acronym and, and you can look it up. Um, there are slight variations on it. But to SCAMPER something is, it really prompts students to use common materials in different ways. It's like substitute, combine, I mean, you could even get them into using two materials and, and then they can start to get a little more creative and think outside of um, the normal ways um, that they're used to seeing those types of materials and objects. Yeah. I would also um, email our instant challenge, uh, challenge masters for some of those material use tricks. Um, and they can be found on our website under challenges, all their emails. Okay, Andrea is asking, she has a team with ages nine and 10 year olds. She wants to strike a balance between over managing them and letting them learn to manage. They are picking up steam, but have a history of missing deadlines and are behind like everybody in January. I don't expect too much ability from this age um, to estimate task and budget times, but I may be underestimating them. I'm used to very specific agendas for meetings and I think it was too specific. For example, 15 minutes for instant challenge, 30 minutes for an IC, et cetera. Um, that age, <laughs> that is primarily the age that I worked with in fourth and fifth grade. And uh, they actually, they deserve a lot of credit. They're, they're a little more savvy than maybe when I first started teaching, I gave them credit for, but I might try experimenting with roles. Um, kind of similar to like you might see in a classroom reading group, right? Like there's the timekeeper, there's the note taker, there's the decision maker. So you could establish roles that are related to what you're trying to accomplish um, by the end of the group time and assign individual students to those responsibilities. And you could type out in advance or you can even do a search on like, um, reading group roles and you'll find some ideas about that but um, you rotate those roles each week so each student kind of gets an opportunity to be the the team the group leader one week and one person is the note taker and one person is the maybe you call it the uh, not the timekeeper necessarily but the uh, scheduler you know like whatever it is you're trying to accomplish assign it as a job or a role for those students and and type up a short description about what it looks like 
and um, they'll run with it. They'll need a little practice. Everything takes a little practice, but that will start to make them feel ownership about meeting those deadlines. And kids really like those kinds of responsibilities. They're like, well, I know that we aren't there, but I'm the timekeeper and we have to have this decision. And the leader will be like, okay, so this is what we've decided. And the summarizer is like, yes, this is what what I heard or whatever. And it can create a really interesting dynamic with the group and um, gives them a lot of ownership over their accomplishments. That's excellent, Shanti. I think as a team manager, make sure you're setting the goals at the beginning of the meeting and when they don't meet them at the end, say, ask them how they are also gonna take ownership. You guys didn't get your costumes done today. How are you gonna fix that? Well, and that's kind of one thing from, you know, when I was looking at the, and, and not to, you know, talk too much, but just in those, in those documents that Kate forwarded, a couple of key things for that is just establish routines and and part of that could be an agenda at the beginning of the meeting that you discuss and say this is what we're going to accomplish do you think this is achievable if yes how are we going to do that you know break down those times who will be responsible for what and if not what do we need to take off our plates and focus more on so just especially as kids get a little older i'd say definitely starting fourth grade they can mm-hmm. absolutely start making those kinds of decisions and being involved in that kind of decision making and and the more frequently you do it the more they'll start to do it automatically like everything it's kind of modeling with kids initially and giving them really clear steps and descriptions of the expectations and establishing norms with them and then turning over that ownership yeah um, to them um andrea you also have to remember that if they if they're the ones that don't get it done it's on them right it's not on you. You're still a great team manager if they right. don't get it done. Because part of the process is to also um, mess up and learn from messing up. Well, and that's something I've seen that's really good that I, I um, when I visited teams and team managers a couple of years ago, I, I went around various districts. And, and one of the things that I thought was so powerful in a couple of them that I saw was five minutes maybe set aside at the very end of group time to reflect on what went well what didn't and mark those things down and then when you come back together the next time say okay this worked really well for us but we talked about how this didn't what are we going to do differently this time so it's an ongoing refinement of their process always have the calendar too. This we only have seven meetings left people, <laughs> but they can definitely, Shanti gave great answers. I like, I like having the um, scheduler and the um, timekeeper. I think that's awesome. So Deborah is asking, whenever we have to choose something, there is always a conflict. Choosing the game for game on took us two full meetings. I am imagining that we are going to have this happening again as we work through how to solve our challenge. Um, if they're taking two full meetings to decide things that should pretty much be decided in about 30 minutes, what you can do, and I don't know how popular this will be, is you make it homework. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Be like, okay, everybody, we weren't able to resolve this issue. We have to have it resolved by next week. So I want, uh, or by our next meeting, whenever that may be. So this is your... This is your project work, if you will. I don't know that I'd call it homework because that has a slightly negative connotation, especially when kids are involved in, in something like this. Um, so you don't want to necessarily tie it to class, but maybe it's a um, project goal for everybody, you know, or the next step in our um, journey or however, you know, it feels, it feels good to frame it for your students. But if things aren't getting accomplished and you're kind of getting to deadline, you can be very frank with students and say, these decisions need to be made by this time, or I fear that we aren't going to be as successful as we could be. So if we can't arrive at a decision by the end of this group, I'm going to send everybody home with like an exit slip, basically that has exit slips. I'm not sure if people are familiar with, but they can be very simple. Like you could get a note card. Um, and you could say, okay, right on your exit slip, I need to decide whatever by next meeting. And then that exit slip becomes their entrance ticket to the next one. You're like, this is going to be your ticket to get back in. Um, your answer on the other side, you write entrance 
and their answer is there. And so then that should be able to kind of like help refine it. Mm -hmm. um, or get them a little more on schedule. That's just yeah. one thought. That's an awesome idea. Also hold snack hostage if they're... Uh... <laughs> Don't hold snack hostage. Don't. <laughs> some, students, some students, I mean, I worked in mostly Title I schools and some students just don't get snacks or a lot of food. I never withhold food. Never. <laughs> Maybe stickers, but not food. Oh, there you go. <laughs> There was uh, a cool thing, I think, um, in that game, that PDF, Kate, um, that that I, there's a, there's a, there were two Word documents and one PDF. There's a cool game on that PDF, and it, it does kind of have a reward system, and it's, you know, substitute the word teacher for team manager in there, but it's like you compete against the kids. Like, I got this many things done, or I earned this many points for doing these things, and you look intentionally for them to meet goals and they, if they earn more points than you do by the end of the group session, then they get something, you know, and that can be something as easy as like a cool sticker that they pick or, you know, they get to decide the instant challenge that um, you're going to do next week for practice or fun, you know, so, so there's some cool like little rewards you can do with that. Yep, that's great. Um, <laughs> um, Leah is asking, what are some ways to grab students' attention and remind them to stay on task? I love that. And there is this, um, there's this great little bit in one of those handouts, but it's something that I learned at a conference quite a while ago. Uh, I think it's, it's interesting. If you have both a visual and audio cue, that draws students' attention back to the task at hand. Um, that's ideal, particularly for working with groups of um, boys and girls, because the research is kind of indicates that um, boys tend to respond to visual cues and girls tend to respond to auditory cues. So if you have both, something I saw was uh, um, was a slide, like a PowerPoint slide with a cool spinning picture and a sound effect, right? But you can also do other simple things, like if you have a bell, that's the sound cue, and then maybe there's a central focus area in the room or the space where you work with students that has a cool picture, you know? So like when they hear the bell and refocus back on the picture, that's time to pause and come back together and regroup. Um, cause it can get a little chaotic with groups and sometimes that's good, but sometimes it can kind of spin out. So just to have that auditory visual could be a really helpful way to bring your group back together. Great. Of course, then there's the tried and true, you know, like teacher chants, like, um, two, three eyes on me or, you know, clapping routines, you know, where you clap a pattern and they clap it back. Um, so just little, little tricks like that, um, can bring your group back on track. Okay. We have a question from Denisa and a question from Deborah that are pretty much the same and it's wanting kind of to understand interference a little bit better. So I'm going to take that one, Shanti. Yeah. I was like, why don't you take that one, Kate? <laughs> I know what interference is, but I struggle with it myself. So, so interference is very, I want you guys to remember these words. You as a team manager can plan, mentor, teach. You are allowed to do those three things, plan, mentor, and teach. You are not allowed to do, create, or interpret. So if, um, so to plan a meeting is completely in, um, you can do that. You can plan the meeting down as close as you want to, depending on how old your students are. Um, you, can um, you can teach them skills, and teaching them these skills that Shanti's talking about, about um, taking ownership of time management, you can teach them time management skills. Um, you can teach them how to use some of the charts in the back of the um, roadmap that have a lot of uh, project management tools in them. You can teach them how to use those. You can teach them how to sew. You can teach them how to um, 
make a decision. All those things are teachable. Once you start doing, like you can teach them how to make a decision, but when they go to make the decision, they have to implement that themselves because they're the ones deciding whether their character is going to be Fred Flintstone or if their character is going to be a Yeti. You don't get to decide that. You can help them find ways and tools and procedures on how to decide. So um, if you are a team manager of a Rising Stars team, we are 100% um, knowledgeable that you are working with five and six and seven year olds. Um, the level that you can help them is there's, you can help them much more than a competitive team. Number one, because they're so young. And number two, it's because they're non-competitive. So there's no penalty. The, the, the more help you give them, the harder it's going to be for them to transition um, into a competitive challenge. So I would try to keep the kiddos at their level doing their thing, but um, but you can definitely interfere a little bit more with those kindergartners than, than you think you probably can. And I appreciate very much that everybody is concerned about helping out too much because you do wanna give the kids as much ownership as possible. But if you just remember that you can do plan, you can, you, sorry, you can plan, mentor, teach, and the kids do create, interpret, you're gonna you're gonna be just fine with interference. Well, and just a follow up question on my part, Kate, just for better understanding. Like you can ask questions of students to help lead them. Of course, you can. Yeah. Like towards making mm -hmm. some kind of decision or or selecting a resource. You know? Yes. I mean, I know I ran into that um, with my daughter's team, and it was five, six, seven year olds. Um, and they couldn't read dictionaries, but they weren't necessarily <laughs> sure of the difference between an encyclopedia and a dictionary. And I'd say, we need to look at stuff. But I like had to teach them the alphabet, and I'd have to read things to yes. them. And, yes. You know, I, I would be like, you know, an encyclopedia would be better than a dictionary because a dictionary does this. And it's like, that's right. not interfering. So that's hard. not interfering because it's not creative. It's not doing the creative implement. So you know, we don't expect kids to know the difference between a nail and a screw unless they're taught it. We don't, you know, what, what are the benefits of using plywood versus using foam board to do a construction project? You, you can teach all that stuff. So if you want to, if you want, if they want to build something with wood, bring them to the Home Depot and have them carry it around for a little bit. They might realize that it's pretty darn heavy and that there's other materials in the Home Depot that are are easier to carry and use. So for sure, as a team manager, you can teach them about all kinds of things about material use and about planning and you can teach, but you just can't be the person that to decide the story or decide um, if they decide that they're going to build something out of paper mache, teach them how to use paper mache, but when they go to actually build their paper mache object, they have to do it. And always use clarifying questions. So once they start doing the script and you'll, you, you can ask questions like, well, how did the bunny all of a sudden turn into an elephant? Um, because maybe you just don't understand and you can ask them all kinds of leading questions. You just can't be the person that decides. Yeah, and on that, I mean, there's this really common teaching strategy. I was thinking of the paper mache, the I do, we do, you do strategy, if you're not familiar with that. Um, so with the paper mache, you might say, okay, we're going to learn about paper mache. I want to make a, you know, a, a pinata today, a super easy pinata. So I'm going to show you how I make the materials and put it on this balloon. Now you each have a balloon, you know, work with a partner to create something and then they should be able to do it independently. So that's just kind of a, a typical phase of learning for students. They need yeah. some modeling like most of us with new skills. Or they could watch a YouTube video. I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> how I learn how to do things sometimes that I don't know. Um, so Deborah, if that answers your question, um, please let me know. I hope it does. Um, okay, so Leah is asking how to guide her students on the improv challenge. Leah, can you give a more specific question? Like what's, what are you struggling with, with, with improv? Wait for Leah to write that down. Mm -hmm. 
whenever I think of improv, I think of those comedy clubs, right, where the improv group yeah. is on stage and they say, give me the name of a person, give me the name of a place, give me the name of a situation. <laughs> yeah. And then the, the students have to like act it out. I always thought that would be really difficult, but kind of fun. Okay, so her question, her question goes on to say they aren't motivated to do the research and get prepared for the challenge. So number one, I would revisit, do they really want to do improv? And number two, I would take a lot of time to play really fun improv games for them to understand how fun improv really is. And then um, make sure that they understand that in order for them to do their improv performance that they actually, the, the research is required. Um, I might add, show them again, kind of the, the models of good improv. Um, again, this could be like an easy YouTube search, find an age appropriate improv group or snippet from an improv show um, that you think would be engaging to them um, that might hook them into, you know, and then it could be a reflection afterwards. Like, what do you think they had to know in order to be successful at that? You could even show them a couple bad improv groups. Sometimes <laughs> seeing bad ones is the best way, right? So like just get a couple examples of bad improv and say like, what worked about this for them? What didn't? And they may arrive then on the arrive at the conclusion themselves through that kind of questioning and seeing bad improv. Um, non examples are uh, that's what I would call a non example um, are often really good teaching tools. Um, you don't want to be them, do you? <laughs> you know, I don't know. Like, so what would you do differently? Like, clearly they didn't know the subject matter or whatever it was, and that might kind of light a fire for them. Yeah. Put time limits on it too. Maybe like say we're going to spend um, 20 minutes researching and then we're going to do some improv games. So have like a, a, maybe a reward element for doing the things that are distasteful. Maybe. I don't know. Or just positive reinforcement is great. I mean, immediate specific feedback is one of the most powerful things you can do for students needs to be immediate and specific and they'll they'll go from that they they work really well with it they don't work really well when they're not sure yeah. you know if they're doing well or not you are doing i'm learning a ton already shanti <laughs> <laughs> i love the i do you we do you do i love that one yeah that's a good Positive. one <laughs> um, I withhold snacks, so no. <laughs> yeah, right. Kate's mean. But yeah, the non-examples is oftentimes a good way That's to motivate awesome. students who aren't getting that far. Like, show them what they might look like if they don't prepare. They might be horrified. and They'll be like, I don't want to be that person. You know, I don't want to do that. Okay, um, a tournament question. Um, can a story narrator read from a script or do they have to memorize the whole thing? That's yours, Kate. Yeah. Oh, whatever the team decides. Know. The answer is whatever the team decides. So either. But, so either they, one hundred. you know, a lot of people come on with scripts, especially younger teams at the regional tournament, if they can read. Um, I would say the more up, uh, further up competition levels you get, people don't really do that, but also they'll have practiced so many times with their script, they won't even really need it. Um, but for sure, there's, there's a good there's... trick for memorizing. What's that? What's that, Shanti? <laughs> I, <laughs> I did this play several years back. The first year we got to read off the script, but the second year it was expected to be memorized. And the actors I worked with, it was really fun. Cause like we'd memorize chunks that we could, but then we would just go through it as quickly as possible. It was like speed memorizing almost. You just like try and say your lines that they'd say them really quickly. There was no pacing involved. And so like we just got through it and it became super repetitive and it was actually a really great way to memorize a script. So if they decide to do that, it's just kind of like speed scripting. Um, and it's kind of fun and it will help them catch it. They aren't allowed, they don't think about it too much, right? So like the recall comes more into play with that strategy. I thought it was kind of a fun strategy. Yeah. 
Um, okay, I think this is going back to the improv question. When we started with the team, it was already pre-decided that they were doing improv. Some members informed us that one member is very controlling and likes to make the choices for the entire team. We asked if we could change a challenge and were told we couldn't. Okay. So I think the problem then, Leah, is that you have someone that's controlling and you ha and because of timing or whatever, you need to stay with improv and that you want to make it fun. So I would go back to all those suggestions of, of just playing improv games, watching really good improv, watching really bad improv. And if you have the ability to take a field trip, go to the Bovine Metropolis Theater in downtown um, and watch your kids, have your kids um, see really good improv. Um, and um, I think I think once they see really good improv, I think they might really get jazzed about about the challenge. Shanti, do you have any advice for a controlling student? Uh, <laughs> well, having taught got gifted ed for so long, I had a lot of those students. Um, it's it's a tricky one. I mean, not one single thing will work in all situations. Oftentimes with students that I felt were being overly dominant with the group, um, I would have to pull them aside, have a private conversation to say, I, this is what I'm seeing happening. I would really appreciate if you could help me invite others in the group to speak. Um, so sometimes bringing them on as your your buddy and not buddy but like a partner in a way and just say I you know like approach it positively like I see you have a lot of ideas and you're a really great planner I mean frame it in a positive way but I see because of that not all students voices are being heard what do you think we can do about that are there any things that you think you could do a little differently while working with the group to ensure that there's a there's more of a balance and that we're getting everybody's ideas um, the other thing is kind of going back to the uh, scenarios where um, you you choose students for certain roles and you don't put that student in um, a maybe dominantly predominantly like talking kind of role that student might be the note taker and then summarizer um, in order to kind of keep the voice um, influence down during a certain session. Um, those are kind of the things off the top of my head, but it, it can be, it can be a little difficult and you just have to kind of um, say, you know, I really, if, if they go on and on, so like, I really appreciate your thoughts. What do others think about this? Or can we piggyback off of so-and-so's idea? Or does anybody have a different thought about what so-and-so said? You could even set timers for talking if the student is, is, uh, overtaking the conversation most of the time, you could implement something that's like, we're trying to sort something out, so we're gonna implement a one minute talk time per person. Each person has one minute to speak. Once the timer goes off, it's the next person's turn to speak. And then I'll summarize the ideas we heard and we can take a vote on the next best course of action. You know, you could just be really intentional about giving time to each student. Not that any of those will necessarily work, but they're good places to start. And like I said, sometimes it's just having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the, with the student um, away from the other students, obviously, because that can cause a lot of embarrassment and discomfort um, and keeping it framed really positively around the strengths that you see the student has and asking them how they can use those strengths to promote ideas from other members of the group. Okay, thank the excellent suggestions. So Andrea has a question. Um, some kids are new to performing and when narrating will be physically active, like jumping around or flossing or something. When I first read that, I'm like, are they flossing their teeth? But then I remembered that there's that flossing dance. So I'm sure that's what oh, she means. That's a sure flossing not... dance? I was picturing flossing teeth. Oh, no, 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 <laughs> no, no, no. It's because we're old, Shanti. Uh, <laughs> it's a flossing dance. Yeah, you these it. kids, they don't <laughs> care about their teeth these days. I was way older before I cared about flossing. <laughs> so, Andrea, <laughs> I think you mean the flossing dance as opposed to flossing their teeth, but good oral hygiene if you guys have floss at your team meetings. 
Um, anyway, she's saying that she thinks this might be mild nervousness when the focus is on them, but she doesn't know. Of course, I can't interfere, but it seems to add challenge to projecting voices if people yeah I can see that um, should they be encouraged to stand and project their lines or move and make them comfortable hoping they'll work this into the act um, I think the best way to do this Andrea is actually to videotape them and have them um, look back at it and see what they see and um, they once they see what you're seeing they'll be able to either correct it or make it a part of what they're doing. Um, you can also, um, in being putting on the teaching hat, because as I said, for interference, you can do, or you can plan teach mentor, um, show them a skit from maybe um, YouTube or something, a skit, a, a DI skit, or just a, um, a Saturday Night Live skit that's appropriate, and, and ask them what others, what, the people in the scene are doing. Um, so you can use that as a teaching tool, as another another thing, or you can ha have them watch their own performance and ask them if, number one, you can ask, did you hear it? <laughs> was was anything distracting to you? Um, and they'll be able to, to they're gonna come up with that, because if people are jumping around and doing the flossing dance, um, it is going to be distracting to the story and they'll see that too. Yeah, I also used to, um, with my students, teach them public speaking skills um, about projecting your voice. Um, and I would model for them. I'm like, okay, I'm turned to the side. Can you hear what I'm saying? And they're like, what are you saying? I'm like, exactly. <laughs> or like when you turn to the back of the wall. And just kind of, I was like, sound bounces. You need to throw it out to your crowd. Like they need to hear you. Um, and and certain movements, I mean, e even if you're talking about staging, you could have them do tape and find their marks, you know, which is a, a stage kind of movement thing. Have them uh, get used to moving around each other. Um, and yeah, I love the idea of recording because you know, I mean, whenever I had to record myself teaching, I was like, whoa, okay, <laughs> I need to work on this. So it's a great tool for getting students to self-reflect. But if they're just a super energetic group and you think they're doing that um, to just kind of be goofy and get some energy out, because I know oftentimes these um, sessions take place after school and sometimes they've been sitting a lot. Um, I also dedicated oftentimes for students who came to me um, about five minutes to just kind of move, you know, we'd stretch, we'd move, we'd do like an eagle pose, you know, like whatever, it kind of got their energy out a little bit um, and they were able to focus a little more. I'm not sure what age this yeah. is, but. Um. Um, Denise is asking about the technical element for the pop-up book and how to get the small kids to understand what a technical element is. I think I got that right, Denisa. Um, again, for your little five-year-olds, they a pop-up book with a technical element can be really so many things from a very basic just folding paper that they like folding paper into an accordion that they pull open um, uh, to more sophisticated solutions. So don't wrap your don't get don't get your head um, lost in the word technical because I bet you you're thinking of wires and electronics and um, a technical element literally can be um, a ramp or a lever is so they a can clear definition for it Kate How is, um, I'm not element? sure in the um, rising stars challenge let me look um, I'm just wondering if there's a clear definition then you can provide the definition and then have kids brainstorm or generate examples of what they think I think in the rising stars challenge it's pretty vague mm. which I think is what the struggle so is, is it just something outside of the main challenge or an additional component no it's part of the pop-up book let comes me, out of the pop-up let me read it let me 
let me read the tip build and design and build a device that moves or does something to help tell your story your technical device can be a prop a costume a piece of scenery a part of your pop-up book or anything else in your play so all it's saying is something that moves or does something to tell the story so that can be they're just trying to get around teach these um, younger kids um, that things can do things that them you know <laughs> um, so you can literally have a ramp or um, and roll something down or you can as I said you could fold a court paper in an accordion fashion and pull it apart it isn't they really aren't meaning anything with wires or switches or anything like that it's just a device that moves so that could literally be something they pull um, it could be something that they push it could be something that they drop um, anything like that does that help I hope okay um, we had the question that we got on that um, somebody emailed us um, today um, my team is a young team and they're just getting down to writing the script this is from Charlotte mm. Bell um, do you have any ideas on how to support the writing process oh this is an excellent one for you Shanti because they're first and third graders I'm unsure how much sitting down and writing out they can do I've encouraged them to improvise ideas and capture their efforts uh, hey, that's such a great question and and you're right it, it is really difficult um, the writing piece can be pretty tricky at that age um, so again I'll go back to something I said earlier oftentimes kids that age process better if they can draw it first so if you can help them create basically a storyboard is the way that I would go is scene by scene so what is our story going to start out with and have them work you know in pairs maybe to start to draw that and then to come together and and decide what elements from the drawing they really want to keep and then have them talk through how they would describe that scene or what they would want characters to say um kate on the physical act of writing i they I can, don't can can they dictate yes they can they the t because again the team manager isn't creating right the team manager yeah. is just so when you so ask, in that instance yeah to take away the barrier of writing right draw it discuss it talk it out and then tell you oops sorry have them tell you <laughs> i got caught up in my cord um what they want to write and then you can read it back to them um, and they can refine from right it. and then you can ask them again leading questions like um how did the elephant can't get in the room i mean if they're writing all of a sudden they say and the elephant says and you're like wait like i don't even know that there was an elephant um you can ask them clarifying questions for sure um you just can't write anything on the script that they don't want on your script so um yeah you're and a i dictator. wouldn't have to write for too much yeah and i mean that takes away like the kind of um, sit down like the difficulty of writing for younger kids right like if they're just able to dictate but I would definitely start with picture I love that idea and Shanti. then have them come back together and discuss and make some decisions and then dictate um, it to you because the, the writing it's not you know it's not gonna you can't have kiddos that young sit for sustained periods of time and write though you'll lose their attention in about two minutes at that age you know we used to do sentence strips or something that was about the max you know yeah. or they could even the ones who can write could maybe even write sentences and they can try and jigsaw them together you can write the sentences that you hear them say onto different strips and then they arrange those and cross out you know almost go through a revision and editing process with what you've put on the strips of paper so they can physically manipulate the sentences and lines and ideas um, which kind of makes it more like a puzzle yeah you also have to remember like when 
I'm not, Shanti will probably correct me because I will most likely be wrong, but I remember when my kids were like first and second graders and they wrote stories um, for us and they would, you know, that was like a month or six week process of writing a story that maybe had eight lines in it. Um, so to write a five minute script is a lot for them. So I would really, um, I would, I love the idea of just doing a storyboard and then have them act it out. And then you just write it down. Cause I think that that it's not school. This isn't school. This is supposed to, <laughs> it's supposed to be, um, a different type of learning. So we want them as engaged as possible. Um, Charlotte also said with her first and third grader Shanti that she hasn't always had a parent helper in the room. Um, so when she's by herself with her team of first and third graders, it's a tough time keeping everyone focused on whatever discussion they're having. I get that. Um, it feels like she's redirecting kids a lot. Um, I also try asking for parent helpers in every email communication I send out to parents. How do I get parents to help? So with kids that age, and again, I'll come back to typically, and I'm, I'm operating under the assumption this is happening after school or during the weekend. Um, having really clear expectations and routines will help eliminate some of that for them. So um, setting an agenda with times at the beginning of each class, having very clear roles defined for students. This is what we need to get done in two minutes. I'm gonna give you this question. You're gonna think, you're gonna pair up, and then I'm gonna call on you to share aloud. I'm gonna set the timer. If you do it in shorter chunks, you'll, um, and if you really intentionally plan out pretty much every minute that you have them, um, I think you'll start to see less of that. It's, mm -hmm. it's when kiddos kind of have free reign. And again, as a GT teacher, my, my room was chaos all the time. Cause I'm like, explore, experiment, uh, you know? And I mean, I, I had lessons, but I really wanted them to dig in. But th I realized with the younger students, particularly that I worked with, they needed a lot more structure than that, or, um, they would easily get distracted and, and get onto tangents that were non-related to what was going on. So like I said, just chunking the steps for them. Okay, for the next two minutes, we're gonna do this. I'm gonna give you 30 seconds to think or 10 seconds to think about it. Then you're gonna turn to the person next to you. You're gonna share your thoughts. And then, you know, at one minute later, I'm gonna start calling on pairs to share out their thinking. And, and one other way you can ensure that, um, students are listening to each other is to add the caveat that they have to summarize what their partner said rather than what they as an individual said. So that can help focus conversations when they're held accountable for listening and reporting out on what somebody else said. Yeah, good. Um, also Charlotte, um, on having another parent in the room, I think for first and third graders, especially if you're a parent and not a teacher, um, I think it is perfectly reasonable to expect someone to help. So um, I guess what I would say mm -hmm. is depending on your own personality type and how um, you can say that we're not going to have a meeting if someone doesn't volunteer to be a parent helper. I mean, you can, you can do things like that if that's as, but that's pretty drastic. Um, but I would also, on a, on, on a less drastic curve, I would say something like, I, it is really important that I have parent help. There's a lot we need to get done. And, um, you know, I, I need your support in order to help our students. So I think asking as directly as you can. And then if you're not getting support, I think you need to just have a little bit of a, uh, your own confrontation with them and saying, you know, I said I would do this and I'm happy to do this. I just need a little bit of help. Because they don't yeah, have do them anything. establish norms. I mean, that's something that I oftentimes did with students. Um, so at the beginning, okay, like, let's, let's talk about what happened when we met last, what worked well, what didn't. And if they don't come up with the, oh, we got distracted and got into all these little conversations or whatever, you could say, I noticed this and I feel like it's impacting us this way. So I'm going to note that. Now let's go through and as a team, let's decide what our norms are. 
You know, what are our expectations that we're listening to each other, that we're staying on topic, that we're taking no more than such and such amount of time to answer and share out about a certain question. Because once, you know, even the younger kiddos can establish the norms that they think will work mm -hmm. and it, it goes back again to their ownership. And like, if you write those things down and you see students um, shifting away from the things, the norms that they created and agreed to, I've, I've actually seen kids like sign it at the end, you know, and as you, there's kind of that proximity rule, right? Where it's like where you can walk around kids when you're really close to that, standing close to them, they tend to get back on track. It's a, it's an interesting thing or a little touch to the shoulder or whatever. Um, then they'll get back on track so they want you to hear them doing the right thing. But even if they don't, you can say, hey, we agreed on these norms. What do you think? Are, are you following this norm? Right. How can we get back there? You know? And I think you need to do the same thing with parents to get the parents the help that you need to be successful is to establish those norms with those parents. I need a parent helper at every meeting. That's the norms that you guys discovered. Um, someone is, is suggesting using Sign Up Genius as a way to get the parents on board for those days. But um, the parents need to help you if that's what you guys agreed to at the beginning of this process. And you need to hold them accountable. Um, we have one last question, I think, Shanti, and then we'll have been on the phone for an hour. Okay. So then we can see what we're doing. Um, but there's only one question outstanding right now, and that's from Leah. What's a good way to divert attention from a behavior we don't want to encourage? Um, so again, and I'm just making assumptions, so please um, type back in if I'm not really answering your question. Um, I think you're asking if you have a, a distracting student. Mm -hmm. um, how to kind of redirect that individual for the the better of the group, right? Um, that again, and there is there is some really good information about this in those handouts, um, by the way. So I would encourage you to look at that. But um, again, the proximity thing, that game where it that's in the PDF, where you can kind of like keep track of things you did and like give them points for what you know, they do um, pulling the student aside privately to have a discussion and trying to keep it as positive as possible. Like, I can see you have great ideas and I'm so excited for you to share them, but I, I see that it's, it's maybe drowning out other voices. How can we work together to, to make sure that everybody's a part of it? Um, it's if they're super distracting and I, and I have had a lot of students that just distract they they need attention for some reason but again it's kind of like um, the more routine you are the more planned you have every minute the less time it allows for distracting students honestly if you're like okay now we're transitioning to this okay you've got five minutes to get this done all right now everybody share out i'm going to be calling on individuals and you're going to have to share what so and so did all right now 10 minutes we're moving over to this i'm going to partner you up you're going to work on this and then we'll share out in the last 10 minutes so the more routine you get and the more um, meticulously planned you are for that time that you have with them the less time it allows for distractions um, if none of those kind of normal strategies work, I would absolutely just reach out to the parent. Yeah. And again, just keep it really positive um, because parents, and, and I mean, I am one, I know I can get to, um, we have a tendency to get defensive uh, when things are called out about our kids. So I've had the most success if I have to go to the parents, just say, I love having so-and-so like the ideas are so great and I can tell that the student is super energized about this but I'm having trouble keeping the student on track or not distracting other students have you found any things that really work or could you maybe come in during a session and and kind of observe what's going on and and give me some pointers or, or help support with this because you know it needs to be it, it's a team effort not an individual effort right and so we want everybody to be able to 
to play uh, an equal role. If you also have a sheet where you establish norms for your team about everyone gets a chance to talk, everybody, we're going to stay on task, et cetera. Um, if, if there's, um, you know, you can always refer back, refer to that and say, hey, according to our team norms, we all need to be at, you know, working together at this point um, as well. You can also distract the student by making the student your helper and have a series of tasks for that student to do throughout. Like, okay, I'm gonna need you to set up materials right now while people are getting in this. Like, I need you to be my helper. Sometimes giving a student that sense of importance um, will switch their behavior because they feel like they've been given a leadership kind of role and they um, intuitively feel more of a sense of responsibility to keep the group on track. So that's another tack that you could take just say, you know, you got a lot, like I can tell there's a lot of energy. I want you to be my assistant this week, depending on the age. I mean, helper for younger kids, assistant for older kids, um, my uh, group partner today. And you can switch that role around with other students, but you might want to start with that student that's super um, distracting so that the student really kind of constantly has something to do. They have to hand out papers or they have to collect stuff or they have to, um, Clean you know, up come up with a challenge <laughs> or, you know, they get to pick the challenge from the jar or whatever, you know, but like if you create a role like that, um, that, that can be, that can be a way to kind of, uh, I don't know, deter that kind of behavior. Great. So earlier this afternoon, I sent out an email um, from Shanti that had th these two Word documents in a PowerPoint. Please read those. I think a lot of oh the, a PDF. Oh, a PDF. A I wouldn't bother you with a PowerPoint. No, <laughs> <laughs> the PDF the is the game. The, so the game is a PDF, yeah. and then there's some suggestions on the uh, Word docs. So um. Open them, read them, enjoy them. Please email kate at dicolorado.com with any questions. We love talking to team managers. This is the first time we've done this um, uh, as a webinar. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope um, everybody uh, got something out of it. So um, thank you for giving us your evening tonight and thank you Shanti for your time. Um, and your expertise. I, as I said, I learned a lot. So I love that. <laughs> I hope it was helpful and I'd be happy to do a follow-up session where you're just like, none of this worked. I need another idea, but hopefully <laughs> some of it will work. And yeah, any questions you have for me, Kate, Kate can uh, share my email. I'm, I'm happy. I usually get back to people within 24 hours, if not sooner. So if there's any additional um, advice, support, resources, that I can offer, I'm absolutely ha happy yeah. happy to do so. So and just I really email, appreciate everyone's time tonight. E Thank you. Email email me, and I'll forward it to Shanti. She is the classroom management small group guru. So um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you all very much, and you have a lovely evening. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Good night.